Testament reading for the day is from Amos 7, 7 through 15. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with, with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word with her or to her. And immediately the king sent an ex executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in, in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated and we'll sing the song that we have sung before. It has been a while. Ancient words.
You've heard the, this, the phrase, we are the only Bible that unbelievers read. So if you're preaching a negative sermon through the way you live your life, they're going to say, well, Christians are hypocrites. They come to church on Sunday mornings, and they say a lot of nice things, and they sing a lot of uh, nice-sounding hymns, but they go out, and they don't live up to what they preach and they say. And a lot of people are turned off by that. Or we can be gracious and loving and respectful and generous. And so that will, of course, coincide with our faith that's in our hearts. And that hopefully will be used by the Holy Spirit to get the attention of some people that um, wouldn't normally want to even look into Christianity. And they might see in our lives something that inspires us and even motivates us them to open up the Bible and take a look at it and see what it says to them and how it might be applicable to their lives. Um, so every one of us is a member of the priesthood of all believers, and we have that responsibility, that high calling to proclaim the word of God in our speech, in our conduct, in our lives. And I'm also a member of the priesthood of all believers, so in my private life, in my sphere of influence, God has called me to do what I just said. Um, but also, I have a little different calling than yours. I've been called to publicly proclaim the word and administer the sacraments. And you might not know this, but sometimes I do it outside the four walls of this building. I go and pay visits to people in nursing homes and in hospitals and share the gospel and words of comfort and life with people who are um, facing some difficult times in their lives. And oftentimes nurses and doctors hear what I'm saying at someone's bedside. And so the message goes in all sorts of different directions that we don't even realize sometimes. I had the opportunity to um, serve as an adjunct instructor at Concordia University a few years ago. And so in the classroom there, teaching Old Testament, I was able to uh, affirm the Word of God to many of the students who had never even opened up Bibles before. There was one girl I remember that came from um, OSU, and she said, what you're saying and what I'm reading is totally alien to me. It's like a foreign language. So I had the opportunity to share the Word of God in that Christian college with people who had never, ever been acquainted with the Word of God. And I preached a few times and have um, the last several years down in the chapel there. And I think only, if I'm correct in this, 15% or less of the students at Concordia University these days um, come from the Lutheran Church. So... A huge chunk of them, even in the chapel services, are maybe not Christian or come from a totally different background. And so I've had the opportunity, the privilege, of not only privately but publicly, because that's part of my calling, proclaiming and affirming the word of the Lord. How many of you here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know most of you here are parents or grandparents, or maybe aunts or uncles. And so you have a real privilege and a real opportunity to be an influencer of children. And just from having vacation Bible school this past week, um, remember what Jesus said in the Word? He says, become like a little children. If you do not become like a little children, there's no way that you can enter into the kingdom of God. And the song that we just sang, we talked about having open hearts to the Word of God. Um, there's something about a child. Um, just watch a child sometime. They have an openness to the Gospel and the Word of God that unfortunately many of us adults do not have. And so, we have a wonderful opportunity to instill truths from the Word of God on our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews, through our speech. And there's something that happened in my life that has um, gone with me for many, many years. I was only eight or nine years old. I was in, in um, third grade. You've heard this story before, some of you, but I cheated on a math test. 
And the teacher wanted to make an example of me. So she yelled at me in front of the whole class. She said, you're a cheater. And she put a big sign. I don't think she'd get away with this these days. She put a big sign on my desk that said, cheater. And she put me out in the middle of the room. And she wrote a note to my parents. And I needed to take the, home, the note home to my parents. They needed to sign it, and I needed to bring it back um, the next day to the teacher. And I was feeling really low. I was really afraid to bring this note home to my mother. And so I finally got it home, and she started crying. And I was feeling really, really bad. And I was going to really feel bad, I thought, when my dad got home. And uh, he didn't say anything until it was time to go to bed. And then when I went to bed, I knew something was really up because not just my mom came in, but my mom and dad came into my bedroom, to my bedside. And I remember they said, are you sorry for what you did? Do you realize that you did something that is really, really bad? And I said, yes. And they said, did you repent? And I said, yes, I'm very sorry for what I did. But then my dad did something which I will never forget. A member of the priesthood of all believers. He wasn't a preacher, but he was the priest of our household. He proclaimed holy absolution over me. He said in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, all of your sins are, are gone. And I really needed to hear those words that evening because I was feeling ashamed and guilty and I was separated from all the other students. I felt like I had done the most horrible crime in the world. But when my father said to me, your sins are removed, God's grace is yours, it lifted that burden from me. And I think as we live our lives, as we are parents and aunts and uncles and managers and whatever we do in our lives, we tend to be more policemen, focused on the law, which is necessary sometimes, but also words of grace and forgiveness spoken at the right time to someone can be a wonderful thing in their lives. It can mean the difference sometimes between a person continuing to live and having hope or just going and jumping off of a bridge. So we have a very wonderful, high and holy calling as members of the priesthood of all believers. But now I want to kind of change gears for a minute and focus in on the Old Testament lesson. Focus in on this prophet of God by the name of Amos. Dr. Brandt from Concordia University theology department writes up notes for sermons, and so I was reading his notes this past week. He said something that caught my attention. He said that Amos was not just a shepherd, most likely. If you read the bare words in our translations, that's what you kind of come to the conclusion of. He was a shepherd, but he was probably more than a shepherd. The word in the Hebrew means more like a sheep rancher, so he probably had a huge herd of sheep and probably a lot of servants under him. And not only that, he was diversified. He was maybe a um, Donald Trump or uh, Bill Gates or something like that of his day. He was diversified. He also had an orchard of sycamore fig trees. He was a great entrepreneur and businessman. God came to him, a layman, a member of the priesthood of believers, and told him that he needed to go to the northern kingdom and proclaim the word of God there. And I want you to notice here that it probably was a very difficult thing for Amos to do. He had people working under him that he had to leave, so he had to find someone to manage everything. He might have had some business deals in the offing. He had to put them all on hold and go up to the northern kingdom, which wasn't that far away, but it was a distance, and proclaim the word of God there. So sometimes we hear preachers making us feel uncomfortable 
with the Word of God, and it's easy to judge them and look at, askance at them and um, not appreciate what they have to do. God is calling them to preach a word that they would probably rather not preach. Uh, they're feeling awkward. They're making other pe people feel awkward. Um, but maybe God is calling them. And so the next time you hear a word that you'd rather not hear, think of the possibility that it's coming from God. And if it's coming from God, then what is God asking me to do? What is the significance of that word that's being preached to me right now in my life? What do I need to change in my life to be in conformity to God's word? So Amos goes to the northern kingdom, and if you know anything about the northern kingdom, a very quick history lesson. Jeroboam the first in roughly 900 B.C. broke away from the southern kingdom, where Rehoboam was the king, and he set up the northern kingdom. The ten northern tribes of Israel came under his rulership. But he was afraid that all the people in the northern kingdom would switch their allegiance to the southern kingdom because they would have to go over the border into Jerusalem to worship in the temple there. So he came up with this clever plan. He made a shrine in Bethel, which is far the south in the northern kingdom, and then another shrine in Dan, which is far the north in the northern kingdom, and said, this is where you can worship now. He made some golden calves and said, this is your religion now, Israel. He made a liturgy and all sorts of ceremonies and hired a priesthood. And basically he led Israel astray. They became idolatrous. This became a national sin. At first, I'm sure there were people that didn't want to go along with this, but... You know what happens when you're surrounded by people who are going in a certain direction. It becomes more and more difficult to stand and go in the right direction. So many, many prophets were sent to the northern kingdom. And one of them in the 8th century B.C. was Amos. And you might remember his word. Wanda read it from the lectern today. Behold. I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be, made, uh, shall be laid waste. Now rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So he's talking about bringing the plumb line into the northern kingdom. And we know what a plumb line does. It helps us to make sure that the walls in our buildings are plumb, they're straight. If they're not straight, everybody, everything's going to be crooked and cattywampus, and the building is not going to have integrity, and it's not going to stand and last as long as it should. And so the plumb line was brought into the northern kingdom by Amos. He made the people feel very uncomfortable. He told them that you are committing idolatry. You're not worshiping and serving the one true God as Moses laid out to you in the Ten Commandments and as your fathers before you served. And then he said, I will not pass by them any, anymore. And that's an a idiom from the Hebrew language, which, which means I will not bless them. You might remember when Moses was up on Mount Sinai and God passed by him when he was in the cleft of the rock. God passed by Moses and blessed him. So that's probably what it means here, that God is not going to bless idolatry. God is not going to bless national sin. When we know what we, that what we are doing is against God's law, God is not going to condone that. And there is going to be some negative ramifications to that. So... Amos was a faithful prophet. He spoke God's word. He brought the plumb line into the northern kingdom. And what was the result? There was one of the paid clergy there by the name of Amaziah. 
he heard some of Amos' preaching, and he quickly went to Jeroboam II, the king, and exaggerated what Amos had said. He basically told Jeroboam II that Amos was starting a revolution, that he was working to topple Jeroboam as king, and then after he did that, he came back and told Amos, you're not welcome here, get out of Dodge, go back to the southern kingdom, do your work down there, but this is a place where we have our own national religion, and you haven't been called to teach and preach here. And that basically, oftentimes, is what happens when someone faithfully brings the word of God into a situation. Um, the devil causes the unbelievers to react in a negative way. We see that in the history of preaching, in the history of the prophets of the Old Testament, and in the lives of many preachers in the New Testament and throughout church history. And so I guess I wonder why anyone would want to become a preacher. If all you get, or it seems like sometimes, is negative reaction, why, why don't you just rather... And I think this is what a lot of Christians do these days, and probably a lot of preachers, just make love and not war. Just practice your religion silently to yourself, and don't make waves. Things would go a lot easier for everyone, right? Well, yes, but that's not God, what God calls us to do. And I would assert to you today that being a member of the priesthood of believers and vigorously sharing our faith, boldly telling people that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's risen from the dead and he's borne our sins, and being a pastor and vigorously telling the truth and promoting the truth in our congregational life um, brings many, many, many blessings here in time and definitely hereafter in eternity. I'm wondering about John the Baptist. What would have been the ramification of him if, in his life if he had not rebuked Herod the king? Well, he would not have his head removed from his shoulders, for one thing. He would have lived a longer life here on earth. He probably had, would have had a lot, of, a lot more respect from higher places. Um, but on the last day, John the Baptist would be standing shoulder to shoulder with Herod before the throne of God. And Herod, I'm sure, would have said, God, this prophet here by the name of uh, John the Baptist, he was operating right in my domain, and he never, ever rebuked me for my sin of, of adultery and fornication. So um, why are you doing this to me? You never gave me a chance. But... Um, so the sin and the blood of Herod would be on John the Baptist's head. John the Baptist would be partly responsible for the demise of Herod if he hadn't spoken the proper word to him. And not only that, there were probably a lot of weak souls who were watching Herod at the time and could have been led astray into fornication, adultery, and other sins if John the Baptist had not spoken up forthrightly as he did. And so, although things ended badly for John the Baptist, he was a huge blessing. And through his life, through his ministry, through his baptizing in the Jordan River, through him bringing the plumb line of God's word and burying it on the people of his day, many, many people came into the kingdom of God. And I think of Paul also. You know, he stood up very forthrightly. We have 13 of his epistles in the New Testament. And he would not back down to the Judaizers of his day who said that, yeah, you need to believe the gospel, but also in order to be saved, you have to keep the Old Testament laws. He could have just kind of ignored that kept peace, but he didn't. And so as you read Galatians and Ephesians, which we uh, had a portion of today, he makes it clear that salvation is by grace alone, through the work of Jesus, and by faith, 
which is inspired by word and sacrament. And then I'm thinking of Martin Luther. We are Lutherans, you know, so every once in a while I think it's good to talk about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, in his day, came to understand what the gospel is all about, and it freed his soul. It took a huge burden off of his shoulders, and the light of God's love shined into his heart. And he couldn't be silent about it, and he started protesting abuses in the church, as you know, and he did not mince his words when he was speaking about the Pope and the cardinals and the indulgent salesmen of his day. And a lot of people came up to Martin Luther and said, tone it down, Mark. We get what you're saying, but we've got to keep unity in the church. We can't break up into all sorts of different factions. If we break up into different factions, then we're not going to have any influence in the world. So... Yeah, we hear you, but tone it down and make friends with the Pope. But we know that he didn't do that. He wrote his catechisms, large and small. He wrote many hymns. He kicked up a lot of dust through his fire and brimstone sermons in Wittenberg. And everything that he wrote went to press. And it stirred up Europe as it had never been stirred up before. And we know the outcome was the Reformation, the Protestant Church, and I would assert to you today that Roman Catholicism would not be uh, in the state of affairs that it is today. I mean, it's probably a lot better off today than if Martin Luther never came, because at the time of the Reformation, um, the Roman Catholics knew that now they were accountable to people. They were accountable to princes and to uh, the people in their domains. And then fast forward to the 1960s and Vatican II. And during Vatican II, and I've got to believe because of a lot of influence from Protestantism and Luther's works, there was a lot of house cleaning that was done in the Roman Catholic Church. The lay people were allowed to actually read the Bible in their own vernacular language and not in the Vulgate through Vatican II. And then fast forward to 1999. Um, some of you might know that the Lutheran World Federation signed a joint declaration with the Roman Catholic Church on the Doctrine of Justification. Look it up on the internet if you're not aware of it, but that was 1999. And one of the statements that the Roman Catholic theologians made, I know that a lot of language was ambiguous. I know there was a lot of wiggle room there, but one of the declarations that the Roman Catholic theologians made together with the theologians from the Lutheran World Federation in 1999 was that you are saved by grace alone through faith. In uh, 1565, I think it was, at the Council of Trent, you wouldn't have heard that language. In fact, they said in the Council of Trent, the Catholic theologians who were assembled there, they said, if anyone says you are justified by faith alone, through grace, or by grace, through faith, let him be anathema, let him be damned. So, I've got to hand it to Martin Luther. He did not back down. His writings are still all over the place. He took a lot of heat. He was persecuted, but because of his strong testimony, his strong doctrine. I know Catholic people today, I know some priests even, who are more Lutheran, really, in their theology than they are Roman Catholic. There's a lighthouse on Lake Superior in the Midwest. And, you know, we have GPS and all sorts of uh, newfangled uh, inventions today, so lighthouses aren't as prevalent or necessary as, there was, as they were before. But there is a lighthouse still on Lake Superior, <clears throat> and it's right in front of a nice, safe harbor. But before you get to the harbor, there's a whole bunch of rocks, and this lighthouse also is not too far from a residential neighborhood. But every night, uh, this big light beams out into Lake Superior, 
And when it gets particularly foggy, it's got a big foghorn. So let's say you were manning that lighthouse. And you're sitting there, and the light is beaming out, and the foghorn is sounding, and you get a telephone call. And it's a neighbor, and, say, and they say, um, you know what? I'm trying to sleep, but um, that light is so bright, it's shining right into my bedroom. Could you tone it down a little bit? And then you hang up, and then you get another phone call. And the person on the other end says, we're trying to have a party here, and that foghorn is so loud we can hardly he he uh, hear each other talk. Could you just tone it down a little bit? Maybe even turn the whole place down for just a couple hours so we can have a little peace and quiet, and then you can turn it back on later on in the night. What would happen if you turned the switch on the lighthouse and everything went dark and there was no noise? What if there was a ship out there that went into the rocks, broke in two, all the cargo was lost, and precious lives were also lost? God has called us, all of us, you and me to be part of the priesthood of believers, to share the word. He's called me to proclaim it boldly, confidently, and not hold back. And the world around us is pressuring us to do just that. But I'm telling you today that we are living in an increasingly dark age, spiritually. The last thing the world needs is a church that shuts down the lighthouse, is the priesthood of believers that dim their light and dim or tone down the message that is to be broadcast throughout the world. May we redouble our efforts through the power of the Spirit in letting our lights shine in this dark world. God will be blessed and there will be many blessings upon us and others. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.